episode of Concussion Chats. My name is Taya. Concussion Chats is a podcast hosted by the McGill students for the Concussion Legacy Foundation with the help of Nick from Concussion Talk Podcast. We're dedicated to providing hope and strength to those suffering from concussions through sharing experiences. Today, I have a recording of our guest speaker, Kathy. Kathy is a five-year survivor of a traumatic brain injury that works as a key speaker as a key player for a variety of different types of companies. She is passionate about neuroscience and TBI recovery. She will be sharing her story of overcoming adversity through self-advocacy and about her recovery that has been centered around neuro-optometric rehabilitation. Kathy is the founder of MakeTheGradeTraining.com and her skills run the gamut from training large groups of teachers nationally to providing consulting to startups and helping small businesses with social media support and customized software integration assistance. The main goal of my um, wanting to present or being invited as well is to share the message of hope. Okay. Um, I was a pretty darn messy TBI case and I'll share that with you. Um, But I just want you to know that there is so much hope. Okay, and even if you've been a person that's had a brain injury for 10 years or more, whatever, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, and you feel like, you know, you've just never found what you needed to solve it, um, you know, we'll talk about that. So that's important. So I'm coming to you from outside of Chicago. Uh, Technically, I'm in Crystal Lake, Illinois. And if you hear a East Coast accent, it's because I grew up on Long Island, uh, Glen Cove, New York. So anyway, and as I mentioned before, uh, that I went to school in Amherst, Massachusetts. So been around a little bit. Um, Whoops, come on. All right. So before my concussion, I was a science teacher, middle school science teacher for over 15 years. I put a little arrow there with the word foreshadowing because fortunately for me, That science background that I had um, helped me in navigating the waters of a brain injury. In addition to you know being a teacher of middle school students in science, um, I'm a a mom with two kids who are now 16 and 21. I probably should update this photo. That's the photo right after the concussion. Um, I'm a guitarist, as you can see, and I also train teachers around the country to use technology, and I still do a little bit of that. When uh, we're not doing the COVID thing, I should say. All right, so a little bit about my accident. Um, I was on a professional development trip. I went up to Calgary, Canada to Smart Technologies. Those of you who have been in a classroom as a student and or a teacher in the past 10, 15, 20 years um, might be familiar with the smart boards that are on the front of the room, in the front of the room in the classroom. So uh, my thing was, is I used that in my science classroom and then I became a certified trainer and I would train teachers to use um, smart boards and I trained all over the country, but I happened to be on an all expense paid trip that smart technologies had paid for, brought me in to um, be there. And then unfortunately, in the middle, you can see the tagline, what a beautiful skyline and BAM. And what the BAM stands for is um, I was midweek through a full week professional development trip, hanging out with teachers, having the time of our lives. We were so excited. We were heading down to Calgary where the Olympics were. I turned and I said, wow, what a beautiful skyline. Because I was at this university overlooking Calgary and BAM, that lamppost changed my life. So I always call this my nemesis because um, I walked straight into it, but at a very fast pace, hit the upper right-hand side of my head and life changed forever. Um, So let's see here. Symptoms, oh my goodness, did I have symptoms. But I was told as I overheard uh, one of the gals say when I entered this call, you know, oh, it's just a concussion, okay? Just, I put that word in, um, in quotes because just a concussion did not ever get me aware of what my future was going to be because that just a concussion really was huge. Um, so symptoms, here's the list of symptoms that I went through in the first year. Uh, the majority of them at the beginning 
quite a few that didn't even appear right away. And I want to I want to emphasize that because if you're early on in your concussion, sometimes you won't have symptoms immediately. But then literally weeks later or months later, you have another oddball symptom and you're like, oh, my goodness, what's this now? But um, some of the symptoms initially were nausea. Uh, big time vertigo. Okay. I didn't even really know what the word vertigo meant or dizziness. You know, I mean, I'd never had those types of issues in my life. Hugely sensitive to sound and light, in particular fluorescent lights. And if I were to say out of all of my symptoms, what one lasted the longest, it's the light and sound sensitivity. Five years later, I'm mostly, I'm like 95, 96% uh, doing great kind of thing. Only occasionally do I notice the fluorescent lights at this point. Um, I do still struggle with some sound stuff and I'll share a little bit more of that probably a little bit later. But my main problems were after I hit that lamppost, luckily I grabbed the post and I didn't fall backward and hit my head a second time. But um, from the moment I walked away from that lamppost, I had this, this feeling that I was pulling to the left. And it's, it's actually, there is a name for it, which of course I didn't know at the time, but it's known as a visual midline shift. And for anyone who's you know, listening, if you have questions on any of these topics, we can talk about them after. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions. But if you notice that you have a sensation leaning one direction or another, you might be a person who has this visual midline shift. And again, um, I appreciated all of the um, legality stuff that you guys said at the beginning about, you know, I'm not advising you, you know, and I'm not a medical doctor or anything like that. So please take anything I say as just an intriguing comment versus, a, oh, she says it's this, because it may not be. But anyway, um, if you have a visual midline shift and you feel this sensation of pulling your body, um, and so my balance was terrible. My balance was if I closed my eyes, I would fall over, kind of terrible. Um, some other things I had, a uh, real strong problem was problems walking in stores. And I bet you if I had right now uh, allowed everybody to unmute themselves, many in this group listening would say, oh, I struggle walking in stores. And in, in this instance, the moment I walk through the doors of a store, the high ceilings, and these are the things that I later on put together that were the causes behind the walking problems, high ceilings, shiny floors, busy um, environmental surroundings. So in a store, your peripheral vision can't block out all these different things that are um, when you walk down the aisle. And so that's one of the reasons that you get your vertigo and, and your dizziness, uh, perhaps. Again, I'm gonna use the word perhaps, can't speak for everyone here, but I know in my case that that was an issue. Attention and concentration, I think most of us would agree. We have some attention problems. We can't concentrate. We reread the line in a, in a book or in a magazine or online again and again, and we don't even know what we read. Um, cognitive exhaustion, I slept every two hours. Um, and then I, and this was for the first like three and a half, four months, every two hours I slept and every waking hour I was researching, trying to figure out what was wrong because um, we're going to talk about the doctor situation momentarily. And uh, that was kind of an epic fail initially in terms of my traditional mainstream doctors that treated me. But anyway, um, poor spatial judgment is another thing that can happen. Um, your depth perception and vision could be a problem. I noted the supermarket syndrome. That was uh, the phrase that the uneducated, and I say that, I'm trying to be nice, uneducated neurologist nicknamed it supermarket syndrome, which makes it sound like it's a psychological problem. But uh, we'll get back to that. Unstudy, nonspecific spatial disorientation. Again, the unstudy part was the balance. It, wherever I was, I was always having problems with feeling, feeling not myself, feeling disoriented. I described it as walking in my own silent movie. 
And, and by the way, you know, I'm just thinking about this for those of you who are, you know, new to having your concussion and that type of thing, feel free to, if you didn't do this already, take a screenshot because some of these things on here may apply to you and it might give you the wording you need to be able to say to the doctor, look, I went to this presentation or I, I attended this and this is what this person was talking about and oh gee, I'm experiencing the same thing if that's the case. Um, I could not watch TV because of the fast movement and I would have um, pain right in the center of my brain from watching that and TV commercials were uh, particularly challenging. TV commercials were horrible because they move so fast and they get louder. And as it turns out, sound and vision are very uh, connected. Um, and then I had what I would describe as electrical storms in the brain. I'm not going to say that I had epileptic seizures. Some of you might have had seizures, which were much worse than anything I'm describing here. Um, but I know I was having weird, the only way I could describe them was electrical storms. So whether they were seizures or not, I'm not sure. I mean, I didn't fall over or anything like that. But definitely it was a very weird experience. Um, and I already mentioned uh, difficulty in the visually complex areas due to patterns on the floor and things like that. Um, let's see here, whoops. I'm gonna skip the day, that particular uh, slide for a moment. So the struggle, I mentioned some of these places, but I took pictures along my journey and you know, looking back on it, I'm glad I did because the, the further out you get from your recovery process, and, and I got to be honest, I feel like I am 95 plus percent recovered. Uh, and I want that to be an exciting bit of news for you that you can get there because you kind of saw the list of things I dealt with. And many of you probably have many of those things. Um, but these were the places shadows. If you look, this was an airport. Um, my job required that I do traveling um, for the training job. So airports, any of these shadows, the fluorescent lights and the high ceilings um, in like a Walmart or a Target were torture to me. Um, I took a trip to a very top neurologist in um, Chicago and I got there and it was a snowy day and I had to walk two weeks, uh, two weeks, two blocks rather from the parking garage to his, to get into his office and between the snow and the tall buildings at the one block point, I could barely walk. And I was, my husband was with me and I'm saying to him, his name's Kurt. And I kept saying, Kurt, Kurt, you got to stop walking. I, I can't do it. I can't make it. And it was because of the visual perceptual problems that were the result of this concussion. So um, then when I got into the office, I said to Kurt, I said, uh, I don't want to be a, um, you know, make a big scene kind of person. You know, I, wanted, I don't want to be dramatic. And so I said, let's wait downstairs until I calm down because my, my whole um, central nervous system was totally um, riled up, I'll say. And so I told him that I said, let's, um, you know, let's wait downstairs until I calm down. We did that for maybe 40 minutes or something. And we were early for the appointment anyway. Then I go upstairs, I go to have the appointment, but the doctor is behind by about an hour, hour and a half. So you, you would think by then that my nervous system would have calmed down. But when we get in there, one of the first things he does is he puts on something called Fresnel goggles because he can see that my eyeballs are bouncing. And that is something called nystagmus, okay? And the bouncing eyeballs, you would think if, if a person were a neurologist, they would say, aha, that might be why she has X, Y, and Z complaint. Because I was describing all those symptoms I described to you guys just now. And you would think that two plus two would equal four. And that, that the man would think to him, eyeballs are bouncing with nystagmus. Well, the bad news on my very top Chicago neurologist was he did not put two and two together and instead chose to uh, choose some other reasons behind my, um, my symptoms. And uh, I'll give you a hint. One of them was he said something like I was menopausal 
So if you can imagine my horror to be told that not only did I have a cushion, concussion, but my symptoms were menopausal really sounds to me like he thought it was psychological as well. So he ignored the eyeball bouncing and chose the psychological answer to my problem. So anyway, as, as some of you can relate, it's just a bunch of BS. It's really not good. Pardon my language there. So um, again, walking in with the tall buildings, the high ceilings, the shiny floors, the shadows, the lights that shine on those shiny floors, the, the visual perceptual, that's a train track, looking down the train track. Um, I'm in my hometown there looking down the way. And if I were to look at that scene, I want to fall over. Then in Chicago, for those of you who have ever been to Chicago, the United Airlines um, is well known for this really wild area over here where you go down escalators. They're, they're actually walking escalators, I guess. You're not going up and down so much, but you go down this whole long pathway where music is kind of blaring and lights are, these are all neon lights. And needless to say, not a good place for a person who's struggling with a neurological problem. Okay, so the journey begins. How many doctors will it take? Um, and I overheard uh, the other gal saying she's had over 50 doctors. I don't think I had over 50 doctors, but I do know that I had in that first year over 150 doctor appointments starting with the emergency room, the primary care physician, got a CT scan. Now, some of you, especially those of you who are newer here might have experienced this already, that one of the tools that they use to diagnose whether you've got a serious head injury, there's two tools that they tend to rely upon, a CT scan and an MRI. Now, when I first arrived at the hospital in Calgary, they did a CT scan. They said, oh, you're fine. No problem. Okay, you're going to be good in four to six weeks. Have a good life, right? Then um, I get back to, uh, the, to Illinois, and, I, and I'm still having horrible, you know, pretty much very early on, all kinds of bizarre symptoms. Go to the primary care. He says, oh, I'll send you to, for a, CR, a CT scan. So I go for number two. Again, normal. Then, I key, then I'm sent to a neurologist and I ask and, and they say, okay, well, reluctantly, we'll give you an MRI scan, normal. So then with that, that's where they start to push the psychological issue. Because as I wasn't getting better in their predicted timeline of four to six weeks, then um, it must be psychological. And I did take a neuropsych test. Now here's an interesting little tidbit. Neuropsych testing can be anywhere from real short, you know, an hour long kind of thing to, you know, days worth, you know, like two four hour days or two six hour days, or they spread it out, however they do it. In my case, what they did was they did a 45 minute neuropsych test. I performed low and, and below average on everything. And they said, oh, you fall in normal range, so you're normal. They never asked me, what's your level of education? I have a master's degree plus 40 or 50 more hours of education. They didn't say, you know, what do you do for a living in terms of me running my business and teaching and all these other things. They were very content. And I didn't know to point out to them, hey, wait a minute, guys. I'm a person that has this high level of education and I'm performing below average on your neuropsych test. That's proof that there's something wrong. But again, they want to stick to their narrative that people are faking it quite often. And not every doctor, I should back up and say some of you might have fabulous neuro, you know, neurologists, you might have a fabulous neuropsychologist, you might have some real supportive people. I'm just sharing my journey, okay? But then where this is leading is where things get real good and hope comes into the picture. Because I got to be honest, my, my initial part of the journey was just terrible. It really was. Um, I went to the regular optometrist. They said, oh, your vision's 20-20. You're doing good. Meanwhile, I was melting under the fluorescent lights in their office, and I was crying and struggling walking. But they said, oh, eyes are good. Um, had to go to an ear, nose, and throat guy to check on the vestibular balance stuff. Again, they, uh, they didn't want to give me a test. I kind of had to fight for something called a VNG test. 
and uh, it's a big name video nice demography test. And those results came back showing irregularities of my nervous system and a whole bunch of irregularities. But that too, for whatever reason, was dismissed by the general doctors who just claimed that I was faking. So anyway, uh, they did audiology testing and one ear was 100% perfect, the other was 92%. So they said, oh, you're fine. But actually that does play into the injury. Um, I paid out of pocket for vestibular physical therapy. And this is what I would say about that. One of the benefits of me having gone there was they were kind and they believed me because I wasn't getting much sympathy or care or even the slightest bit of interest by the initial team of doctors that I went to. So vestibular physical therapy did not solve the problem at all. And in fact, in some ways, you know, certain times they really aggravated the problem because they pushed me too far because they didn't really know how to deal with TBI. But I gotta be honest, they were the kindest team at that time. So I, I don't look at it as a mistake, although I paid several thousand dollars to go to them that wasn't covered. But um, anyway, told you about the uh, VNG. I went to an acupuncture doctor. They really didn't have the skill set for TBI. Massage therapist, um, no. But the neurooptometrist, here's where I'm going to go ahead a page and then I'll go back uh, or ahead too. I don't know how many of you have had an opportunity to read or listen to The Ghost in My Brain. This book was written by um, a professor of artificial intelligence from DePaul University. Clark Elliott is his name. And Clark had a, had a minor fender bender accident. And some, some of you that are in the group here, I don't know your stories, but maybe one or two of you are in here because you had a car accident and had you know some significant issues thereafter. But Clark Elliott did not have a bad car accident. It was just somebody hit, rear-ended him from behind. And then that began an eight year journey of a lot of the concussion symptoms that I just went through and listed that I had. But Clark is the kind of guy, he's very meticulous and he took like 1200 pages of notes on his story. And then what he ultimately did was he found the answer in, in a few different doctors who were able to basically give him his life back. Okay, so that's why the title is How a Concussion Stole My Life and How the New Science of Brain Plasticity Helped Me to Get It Back. Okay, so Clark got his life back um, and the solution that Clark had, okay, I read about, my accident was 2015. His book came out in April of 2015. I wandered, I'll, I'll say I wandered in the desert of concussion trying to figure out on my own what was wrong with me because the main doctors were just kind of stupefied on it and just didn't know and they really didn't have an interest. They made it kind of clear that, you know, they just weren't that interested in, in my situation. I should be better. And that was it. That was their final note. You should be better. And, and if you're not better, it's something you're doing wrong. But um, anyway, so around uh, the accident was July of 2015, sometime in October of 2015, I find the ghost in my brain. I feel as a human being very, very indebted to Clark Elliott for having written this book. He wrote down all the details of his, his head injury and all the symptoms. And it's a bit, it's a thick book. It's about 300 pages. Um, but it's also available on Audible. And so if you haven't listened to it or you haven't gotten it, you might find it good on Audible, you know, uh, um, if you don't want to read it kind of thing. But the key to the book was it was at my local library. I found the book. I started to read it. I could not put it down. Now, I should back up and say some of you in this group very well may not be able to read at this moment. Okay, it's not that you didn't read before the injury, but you may not be able to read. Don't be hard on yourself. That's not uncommon following a concussion. Again, I'm going to talk about some potential helpful solutions for that, but you could at least listen to the book or parts of the book or listen to the interviews. Um, Clark Elliott is interviewed on YouTube, 
okay? So you could even just listen to shorter versions of his story. He has a website. He's got a media page on the website that has uh, podcasts and things that he's been on. So there's many ways you could learn about his story if you didn't feel like, oh my goodness, I can't read a you know 300 page book or I can't listen to it, I won't be able to concentrate or that type of thing. The other key though is have your family members listen or read this book okay this book i was floored that it it his description he's a very articulate person uh very very good at describing things and he described things so well that i wasn't able to make my doctors understand because i didn't have the wording but i will tell you a key thing that i um got out of the book right away was that our brains have something called neuroplasticity and that was my hope of all hopes and it's the hope i want you guys to have which is your brain can rewire itself okay and in clark's book he mentioned another man named norman doidge who has a book called the brain's way of thinking or the brain's way of healing rather and Norman Deutsch talks all about the neuroplasticity of the brain. And the moment I grasped those concepts that my brain could change, and the moment I read this book, I knew I was gonna get better. Okay, so that's what I want for you guys is, again, it doesn't matter if you're new to a concussion or you've been at this for 10, 15, 20 years, and you've had so much, you can still improve your, your brain because of neuroplasticity. So um, here's where I wanted to just go back and finish this slide a little bit. The neurooptometrist um, is one of the people that was mentioned in the ghost in my brain. I'm gonna skip down at the bottom. There's a second person that does what's called cognitive restructuring. I have worked as a patient with both Dr. Deborah Zielinski, who's mentioned in the book, and she's the neurooptometrist. And then I worked with Dr. Donna Lee Marcus, who does what's called the cognitive restructuring. And she also now has brain games that are brain apps that help to strengthen some of the neurological processing and things. Um, I should say just as a, um, disclaimer or whatever, or I don't know what the term is, that I've actually done work, you know, paid work for Dr. Zielinski after my healing process. I, I started to partner with her. She was doing some workshops because she's here in Illinois, I should say that. Um, and so I helped her, uh, you know, do some three-day workshops where she trains other doctors. So I really learned a lot about neurooptometry after you know, or actually during and then after the uh, head injury situation. I also worked with Donna Lee uh, Marcus doing cognitive restructuring, and she's a brilliant, brilliant woman. Um, okay, so my main solution were the glasses, okay, the neurooptometrist, uh, Dr. Zielinski, and again, I'm not trying to advertise her. You have, you, there are neurooptometrists around the world, okay, some good, or, or I should say some better than others, but um, I was blessed that Dr. Zielinski it, had been working with brain injury for 30 years by the time I got to her. So anyway, that the middle picture represents that I ended up with prism glasses. And then um, this other picture down here, I also worked with somebody who was a functional neurologist. So that's a chiropractor with additional training in brain function. And they're really, really good. I also worked with someone who did um, neurofeedback. Okay, so, so similar to the, uh, the, the lady who spoke at the beginning and said she'd had over 50 doctors, I didn't have 50 doctors, but I sure had a lot of different things that I tested out to try to improve my functioning. Okay, so we're gonna wrap up some things. Here is a key point to understand whether you're uh, the person with the concussion or, or traumatic brain injury or you're the caregiver. And that is, in my experience, every doctor, for the most part, was their own island. 
meaning that the primary care physician really had no conversation with the neurologist. The neurologist had no conversation with the ear, nose, and throat guy to talk about my vestibular balance disorders. Um, and, and so that was a real problem. Okay, so minimal collaboration was a big problem. And, and so what I, what I describe is I would love to see in a perfect world something like a Mayo Clinic that had all these different practitioners, okay, and that they would refer to each other and then they would talk to each other because uh, there is one advantage, and, and, I, and I say this very gently, um, I was not... Um, I don't want to use the word lucky enough because that's the wrong word, but I was not put into a brain rehab center. If you are in a brain rehab center, then the doctors work together and there's some real advantages to that. If you are a person like me, which many of you in this who are listening probably are, you know, you hit your head and you have a problem, um, but you don't end up in a brain rehab setup, and then you have to flounder like a fish trying to find who can help you, and you go doctor to doctor to doctor, and as I mentioned, they don't speak to each other and they don't even believe each other. My, neuro, my neurologist knew nothing about neurooptometry, and yet neurooptometry has been solving, uh, you know, brain injuries for 30, 40 years or more. So anyway, I, I describe it in my perfect world. I would love a Mayo Clinic that was for brain injury that had all of the doctors that we needed in it, including the PTs, the OTs, the neurooptometrists, and that type of thing. Um, so, you know, concussion, I saw this one, you know, and it just talked about concussion. It can affect your language. It's linguistic. It's somatosensory, meaning, you know, your central nervous system uh, has problems. It's vestibular. That's your balance. It's headaches. It's, auto, it's autonomic, um, you know, and the autonomic system is part of, you know, that's your central nervous system. And so different things no longer work the way they should. Um, it, ocular means that it's visual, it's anxiety, it's got attention issues, it can be in the neck, uh, lots of fatigue and things like that. So all, there's a lot of practitioners who can help us. I'm just sharing with you the ones, you know, how I found my team. So my end all team, and this is one of the last slides, my end all team became neurooptometry, um, cognitive restructuring, with uh, Dr. Marcus. And then the last one was functional neurology because the guy that, uh, the team that was trained with functional neurology really understood the nervous system and the vision and they knew how to actually give me vision therapy. So um, after all of that, you know, my life is back. I'm doing good. I, I did not return to teaching, but I did, um, you know, uh, go back to a fully functional life after, and it took me a, about two years to get my life back. I do say that lots of good came out of this, which I'm hoping that maybe you can, you can experience as well, in that as bad as it was to lose my job in teaching and to be floundering and trying to solve this problem that nobody was interested in, except me and my family kind of thing, um, you know, there was a lot of good. Um, I, I, I'm not going to lie. I lost friends along the way who didn't call, didn't follow up with me. I know that's a common complaint of people when they have medical concerns. Um, I gained new friends. I have a wonderful team of doctors that I'll always be, in, you know, um, indebted to because of their knowledge and their caring, you know, um, and now I work and I do things like this, but I also work with different companies that are involved in, in being part of a solution to concussion care. So what I wanna really end with is that there's a lot of hope, and I'm, by the way, I'm happy to take questions. Um, there's a lot of hope. You have neuroplasticity on your side. And um, what that really means is your brain can rewire, and in my experience, um, after the, the very first, um, the very first pair of glasses that I had from the neurooptometrist, I had a tremendous change in symptoms and improvement. After the second pair, another change and improvement. And it taught me really very clearly that your brain rewires very quickly. 
Okay. So there are, there are, there are tools, there are ways that we can feel better. And, and there are resources, which I'll be glad to share some ideas in terms of where you can go online to find some things. But uh, I think, yeah, I think that that probably covers it. And then last thing I wanted to say, I just happened to like this, this uh, image. It says, when the Japanese men broken objects, they aggrandized the damage by filling the cracks with gold. They believe that when something suffered damage and has a history, it becomes more beautiful. So I want you to think about that. You have had some damages that have happened to you, but what I really want you to think about is your history makes you more beautiful and, and you've learned a lot. I'm sure you're all sharing a lot with others or if you're not right now up to sharing your story, maybe down the road you'll be doing what I'm doing, which is to talk uh, you know, to groups and things like that, to share the hope that you can get through this concussion, you can beat it, and uh, yeah. So that is it. That's my story, and I guess I'm sticking to it. Thanks again to Kathy for such a great uh, informational talk. Um, today I have Emily, who is also part of McGill Students for Concussion Legacy Foundation, Nick from Concussion Talk Podcast with his co-host Aaron, who is the coordinator for Newfoundland and Labrador Brain Injury Association, joining me today. So. Hey. Thanks, Taya. Uh, I guess I just started, I thought it was, uh, interesting about that which she's talking about collaboration and mm -hmm. uh how that's that's so important it's not the same experience i had first time when i was i was down when i was in concuss but when i was so i guess the doctors had to get up you know be more involved with my care because it was it was more acute but uh but um but i, th I thought it was just very interesting that i mean she was mentioning that we need the information information out there because she yeah. was talking about uh as not many people know about neuroplasticity is that's you know, a new thing to people but remember my physical therapist my physiotherapist mentioned it to me or not mentioned it but said basically that was it in mm -hmm. 04 so it's been a while it's been yeah. a, I, I, as far as i remember i mean that's what so i mean it's been around a while but it's just not being communicated as well as and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the uh, between people, so just a like neurologist and optometrist and any pain specialist or yeah, GP, yeah. anything else. So just the, the communication is so important, and I think that also depends on, I guess, where you are and time. Uh, so what's available in your area? They can't. People are like separated. There's a GP in your area, or like maybe those are neurologists per chance, but then there's a good ophthalmologist like 200 miles away or whatever. And then or, yeah. yeah. Then chances are they don't even know each other. They're not gonna. They're not gonna yeah. know who to reach which out to. Makes, yeah, which collaborations. Makes what you're talking about um, really difficult. Like her idea of like them all working together it makes so much sense. It, it does, would definitely yes. be the best um, approach and like thing because then yeah. they're all communicating exactly. and they can help the person yeah. more. But like you said, yeah, it's really hard depending what's around you, where you're from. Um, but it definitely would be really beneficial. It can be, yeah, uh, can be. It's a logistical, logistical nightmare for yeah, people. For, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Like, for example, here, most people who have had a traumatic brain injury of any sort will only spend a few days in the hospital and kind of been sent on their way. There's not a lot of rehab resources. And honestly, when she mentioned a uh, functional neurologist, which is basically a chiropractor with brain specialization, I didn't even know about that. I started looking up to see if there was any like around here that I could refer clients to because I was like, yeah. "That's something that That's I could try to reach out to." Uh, I I know there's a pair. There's a not a functional neurologist, but I know uh, from uh, Concussion Compass, like Molly Parker and Natasha Wilch in BC. And Natasha is uh, she well, the both physiotherapists, but Natasha has training in function in like. With, with functional neurology as well, but she she is a physiotherapist, so mm -hmm. they're on Twitter, on Twitter, on Facebook, they may be on Twitter, but I meant to say that they're, they're on Instagram, Instagram, yeah. concussion, at concussion compass, but uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I think there is um, I think this kind of goes back to there's this 
the reason we don't hear about functional neurologists, there is this um, sort of divide between traditional neurologists and. Um, sorry, can you, sorry, Emily, can you repeat that? Do you understand? Yeah, there's this um, sort of divide between traditional neurologists and chiropractors that happens. Yeah. Um, I think you're covering your mic, Em. No, <laughs> I'm not going to hear you you're fine now. It's just as long as you speak, I can hear you. Um, yeah, so I think that this divide between the neurologists and the chiropractors is part of this issue we don't hear about, or why we don't hear about um, functional neurologists. Historically, there is this um, <laughs> there is this divide because there because the training for chiro chiropractic care isn't necessarily the most regulated. And there are these horror stories of chiropractors really injuring somebody in a neurological way. Now, so I think part of that goes into these functional neurologists that are chiropractors have, you know, much more specialized training. And I think the big thing with it is going in and just doing the research and seeing, you know, what are the reviews on this particular chiropractor? Because I have... I don't see this divide with the optometrist and the physical therapist. My neurooptometrist here in Nashville, she's recommended a functional neurologist to me, which is a chiropractor. So I think, you know, just kind of like put out the feelers, check the ratings. Yeah. Um, that is part of the reason. Have someone do it for you if you're concussed. You can have people do it for you. <laughs> yeah. And you really want somebody who knows what they're doing as far as chiropractic care because you don't want your head Mm -hmm. walk around in weird ways so I, yeah you say don't just go to any old chiropractor yeah you might be kind of jarring <laughs> yeah, be worse off than yeah just like we have the people who are specialized in yoga for tbi like it's important because your head movement is really important yeah. um but i do think it's really interesting mm-hmm um, something else um kathy said uh was about how her symptoms didn't, uh, like, not all of her symptoms um, appeared right away. And we actually have someone in the support group who um, experienced, like, a like a few months delay before they got, like, symptoms of their concussion. Um, so that was interesting, too, um, just that she talked about um, how, like, her symptoms changed over the year. Yeah, that uh, the, personally, that's one thing I just I can't really relate to that well about delayed de, mm -hmm. de, delayed symptoms. But um, maybe Aaron and Emily know more stories about that. I know it. I know it, it's often the case, but I mean, they have more experience with that right there, yeah, yeah. through people or through themselves. You know, it's definitely something I've heard the symptoms mm -hmm. in and later. Yeah, especially like I hear people getting to car crashes and and they feel fine that day and that night and it's the next couple of days yeah that they really feel it and whether it's this like you know running on adrenaline or i you know i'm not really sure but i do know that secondary you have the, your initial injury and then there are secondary mm -hmm. uh, injuries that occur on a you know neuro biological level yeah um, and take I think it's still we're unclear on exactly how long some of those changes can take effect, but um, it, it's definitely happening. Oh, it's definitely yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just really interesting that uh, it works. It'd be kind of scary. Um, yeah, no, it's yeah, it's like interesting, but also kind of scary for sure. Especially if like you're someone that like you went months feeling like you were fine, sort of thing. Um, but I think the whole like car crash and then feeling fine like that day next couple of days that's when it hits that kind of makes sense like the whole like adrenaline yeah stuff. So, something else that I think um that she brought up that I think is something that's really important um that I think personally I've always <clears throat> thought more of when I'm thinking about athletes but this whole um doctors not taking into consideration your baseline so she was yeah. somebody with you know, high levels of education and she, you know, historically has scored above average on things and then she was scoring in an average range. And I guess I always think about this 
Um, <clears throat> because in my, in my situation, I didn't have a baseline test for my reaction time. But we knew that because I was a goalie and I was quite good at it, I had a really fast reaction time. So scoring anything less than the you know, 99th percentile was not, like, good for me. Yeah. That, um, yeah. Aaron, I, I don't know if you can do a t attest to this in your work, but it, it can be really frustrating for a patient to be told, oh, this is average, this is normal, you're fine, when in reality maybe this patient had a much higher baseline. Yeah, it's certainly difficult, too, for, like, any specialist or doctor going into something, mm -hmm. and you lay out one test knowing the person now, and if you never had any previous follow through, you're just going to be like, this is it, like, of course, this is just kind of yeah. how you are. But unless you know that patient history and take that time to learn it, you're not going to actually improve anything. And I think it's kind of just an important lesson to the doctors more so, is that patient history is the absolute most important Very thing they do. Yeah. But if they come in with no, if they're, there's no, if the patient just comes in, but they can, they have nowhere to get a history from, you have to be honest with your doctors and not be yeah, too humble good. or too boastful about your abilities and just... Be honest, like, I can do this well, like, I can't do that well, which is very difficult for people to know if they can, if they are, like, if they could, like, I'm just saying, like, I, I have a fast reaction time, or, or I have a, you know, I have a slow reaction time, or I'm, yeah. I'm not very good at math, or whatever, or, you know, I don't, yeah. I don't speak clearly, like, that kind of thing, but, mm -hmm. and for a doctor to know that, but I mean, if you just come in, you kind know, of off the street, as it were, then how's the doctor, the doctor to know, no way to really tell unless you actually, or just have somebody come with you, like a family member, family member, yeah. or a good friend, yeah. or spouse, or partner, just come with you yeah. and just know that, say, okay, this person is, yeah. yeah. Yeah, even within personal experience, my grandmother, after she had the stroke, she was always not terribly horrible for knowing what day it was. Like, you could yeah. ask her, yeah. be like, hey, like, what's the day today? And she'd be like, oh, it's like, April and it's like we're not November like what are you talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so I they were asking her questions after the story by that by like, the way Aaron they're April and are in November are months not days yeah <laughs> ever <laughs> <laughs> what I mean but... <laughs> no um so they were trying to ask her the questions though and I was just like yeah, these aren't good questions to ask like you're not gonna get a good rating because she would get this wrong no matter what yeah like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So no, having but, that support is important. Yeah. yeah. No, but like Emily was saying, like the knowing how educated she is um, would have been a super important factor um, for the doctors when they were doing these tests, though. Um, and like, I feel like that should just be like something that like they just ask in general, just like asking what you did prior um, would definitely be important. Um, but you know well and there's the other difficult thing is like then we get back into the like when my doctors kept asking me like are you sleeping more or less and I was like I don't know I don't remember <laughs> <laughs> like I just don't remember how much like yeah I could fall asleep right here but maybe I could do that before I'm not really yeah. sure <laughs> like I have no idea it's, it's I great. mean that that just um, like reinforces the like bringing someone with you is super helpful if you can for sure. Yeah, definitely, I agree. Mm -hmm. Going back on the symptom setting in later. Now that we're talking about this, <laughs> I'm remembering my tests, and um, <laughs> it's really bizarre. And I don't know if it was just a fluke, but every now and then I think about it. Is I got my first like real testing done six weeks after I got knocked out, and then I went back a couple months later after do, working with a neurooptometrist and a vestibular therapist. And uh, my, my memory went down. That's <laughs> what happened. Like, everything else went up, and my memory went down. Your memory of, of, like, short-term or long-term or just, just in general? Okay. Short-term. Yeah? Like, memory, yeah. Maybe hmm. it's back better now, but I wonder about that. The other really cool thing she talked about is um, she was talking about vestibular physical therapists and how they maybe didn't help her that much, but they believed her and they were kind to her. Yeah. And I had a, 
I don't I think my vestibular and physical therapist helped, but I don't, you know, I don't, they got me to where they could. Some of it felt confusing, but they did. They like understood and they tried to understand and they believed me. And just having that was, you know, I'd see them three times a week. That was so important. That's also so validating, especially when like you're being told by everyone else that like you're fine or like why aren't you better like you're not you're like nothing's wrong so I think having someone that's like part of your care team like validate your feelings and um just like hear you and also just like not bully you like just like kind caring people yeah when when I hear things like that that just reminds it makes me think because I never I never I had no idea about this I had I mean, I was I said I was injured in 03, so that was before much of this, much of, there was much noise about it, but, uh, yeah. but uh, still, but I mean, my, I never had any problems with this being, ignoring your thing or faking it, or, mm-hmm. or I, like, my doctor, all my doctors and any physiotherapist, therapist, and all, any other therapy or caregivers, I guess, would, or just always yeah. blame me and always blame everything, so I've never mm-hmm. experienced this when I hear about this from a lot of people like all the time saying that their doctor didn't believe them or their or the nurse didn't believe them or the which is so didn't believe them and, and, uh, so sad. yeah it's just how lucky I must have been. I was just just I had no idea yeah. if this stuff existed that or, or me yeah so yeah yeah it's, it's a pretty like frustrating experience to go through I think I went be. to four or five six somewhere around there doctors in my hometown before we ended up driving couple hours to see a specialist well, I was just so so frustrated it's like yeah. upsetting um yeah. and she also I think we touched on this with Raphael's talk about um the ghost in my brain the classic yeah Clark I gotta read that cause I've, this you guys I always talk about it, the but... audiobook if you can or read it if you can it's That's great cool. I have to I look sent for a it. link of the book to my mom, and I was like, "Hey, Christmas gift." <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There, everyone. See, it's the, the library. It is at the library here. Yeah. Honestly, I haven't looked at yeah. being just reading novels now, so I'm not really. There you go. But so you know, I'm really. I don't know if you. That's the last book I read was not a novel, but it was a. <laughs> but anyway, it's not about not about brain injuries at all. Mm-hmm. But um, it was also nice to hear that like even through all the stuff that she went through the last five years, like that, like she was like, her life is back. She's doing good. She didn't return to teaching, but she feels like she has a fully functional life. She talked about how she's like 95, 96%. Okay. Yeah. Like there's still bad days and stuff. Um, and it took her a couple years to feel like she had like her life back. Um, and a lot of good came out of it, um, yeah, as that's... bad as it was, like losing teaching um, and trying to resolve everything and losing some friends. But she gained some friends, uh, like gained some new friends, um, has a wonderful team of doctors and feels like there is a lot of hope um, and talked about how like we have neuroplasticity on our side. Our brains can rewire And um, she also mentioned how after her first pair of glasses from her neurooptometrist, she saw a crazy improvement. Um, And then she's had a few pairs since then. And um, they've been really good for her, too. I think I think that was just so I mean, to hear that she's kind of happy with her life now, that's sweet to hear. And that she has new friends. So she was and and I were talking to uh, Curtis Anderson yesterday, which will be out the pockets be out if you listen to this tomorrow. Which is Tuesday. We'll be out Tuesday. So, but uh, we were both saying that you know it's how it's just people. It's hard to not about losing friends or getting friends, but just that people to to understand where you're, you have to really so you have to really have the experience to know where somebody's yeah. coming from, no matter how much you how well you can define it or describe it. Yeah. Like, it's no, just, like you, would you never need some, actually... someone. Somebody actually has had it. Has had a, a brain injury. You really understand it, and that that's. I think that's probably where a lot of her new friends are coming from, that people who actually understand her, who understand mm-hmm. that, and kind of, you know, are more sympathetic, I guess, is, but yeah. in, in, the, in the real sense of the word, not in the feeling sense of the word, but just 
Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. no. I, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know what you're trying to say. Sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Um, so thanks um, for. Wait. Wait. I just want to. I want to repeat the quote that she said at the end. Because <laughs> okay. it's really good. <laughs> yeah, I, yeah. It says, when the Japanese mend broken objects, they aggrandize the damage by filling the cracks in with gold. They believe that when something suffered damage and has a history, it becomes more beautiful. And that's all. Yeah, well, actually, I don't know if you did that on purpose. Let me tell you about, I found the, the <laughs> website more of a, the uh, Kintsukuri, Kintsukuri, which is what it's called. It's, uh, and actually, there's a song by a local band, local St. John's Newfoundland band, here was at a, uh, it's a few years old now. It's like, it's like yeah. five years old, I guess. I shouldn't yeah. say, because I don't know, but it's a few years old, because they're not, no longer together. So, I um, mean, and it's called Kintsukura, and I'll put that in the show notes. A YouTube, a, I'll put a link to, I'll put a, I'll add them in the uh, Instagram bonus. Instagram show notes, so they'll, they'll throw it up there as a band anymore, so that's not going to be much help, but, uh, and you, know, fine. you know. But, yeah, I really like that quote. It's just kind of like reiterating that, like, your history makes you beautiful, and, um, like, you go through all this stuff and you can come back better than ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? All right. So we'll try this again. Emily, you're going to interrupt. Thanks for helping us do this, Nick. Um, And thanks again to Kathy for an awesome talk. Um, I know the support group really enjoyed it. Uh, We'll have another podcast posted Monday morning. Our upcoming podcasts can be found on concussiontalk.com, Spotify, YouTube, and Apple Podcasts. You can find more information about our group on concussionmtl.com. Our peer-to-peer support group is free and open to everyone. We hold three weekly meetings on Zoom, which we'll link in the description. Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thanks. Head Check Health bridges gaps in concussion care through simple, powerful technology. Join organizations like the Canadian Football League, Trek Factory Racing, the Canadian Junior Hockey League, Eastern Washington University, and Volleyball Canada who rely on Head Check to improve communication and optimize care. Visit headcheckhealth.com for more. The music at the beginning of this podcast is by Ben Sound. W www.bensound.com